Hi, I'm Jeffrey Baer, and this is The Great Chicago Quiz Show. Coming up, contestants from all over Chicagoland show us what they know. Why are these questions so difficult? Or don't know. <laughs> about the city and the suburbs. Tonight, we look for answers in the stars, but you don't need a telescope. We ask what in the world Britain's Queen Victoria had to do with the Chicago fire. And I'm no Henry Louis Gates, but we'll find the roots of Bud Billiken. All that and more in a minute, but first, a pop quiz just for you at home. What, you thought you could just sit there and watch? Okay, here's your quiz. The flag of Chicago is everywhere, right? You can picture it. Now, how many stars are there on the Chicago flag? The answer, next on The Great Chicago Quiz Show. Hello and welcome to The Great Chicago Quiz Show. All right, the rules of this game show are simple. Have fun, and I'm the only one allowed to use Wikipedia. We'll kick off the competition in just a moment, but first, the answer to our pop quiz. How many stars are there on the Chicago flag? You can picture it right, one, two, three, four. That's right, there are four stars. But what do those stars represent? I wonder if our first contestants know. Introducing the first round. Hi, Fahima. Hello. So I'm sorry that's all the time we have. Thank you very much for joining <laughs> us. Are you nervous? I'm very nervous. Are you really? I know nothing about Chicago, so I feel like Ernest is really going to carry the weight She knows a lot about Chicago. She's being modest. It's going to be a good time. We're going to make history here. Yes, for all the wrong reasons, but I'm in. How do you feel about this? I feel ready. I'm not, not, no expert, but we'll see what we can do. So you're no expert. So why on earth did you volunteer to do this? <laughs> I got asked, you know. Okay. So uh, first we have to get to know you a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm a field producer for CNBC. I get to travel the world as part of my gig. And OPEC is one of my absolute favorite stories to cover. Close to 100 journalists, they open the doors and they say, all right, you can run up and talk to these ministers. I mean, it is insane. You'd think Brad Pitt was in the room. <laughs> People are serious about oil. I think next time you're covering OPEC, uh, you should show up in a Tesla and just, you know, really <laughs> stick it to them. All right, we're going to ask you some questions that have nothing to do with anything we've been just talking about, but this is to test your knowledge of Chicago. All right, so we just learned that there are four stars on the Chicago flag, and the first three represent Fort Dearborn, the Chicago Fire, and the World's Fair of 1893. What does the fourth star represent? Is it A, the reversal of the Chicago River in 1900, B, the 1909 Burnham Plan of Chicago, C, the World's Fair of 1933, or D, Super Bowl XX. Which one of those is the fourth star? Oh, I like this, they're consulting. This is like the old newlywed game. Well, they're all historic, all uniquely Chicago. So you're vamping here because you're not sure. For a flag, what else would you want? Well, we talked about the reversal of the river in 1900, so we're like celebrating sending our sewage down the Mississippi to St. Louis. <laughs> no, let's rule that one out. You thinking it's the Burnham Plan? Burnham Plan, you know, as we know, is the histor is historically kind of how the city rebuilt itself. I think I gotta go with the Burnham Plan. You have to? I think I want to. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> we should do what we want, but you're wrong. Uh, you think it's the World's Fair? I kind of did. It got one star before. Yeah. I know 33 was big. That seems like a reason to put a star on a flag. I'm thinking it's the World's Fair. You are right. How about that? There we go. Yeah. Two World's Fairs. So, yeah. so half of our stars are for World's Fair. All right. All right. So I want to hear a little bit about your wedding. You wore matching sweatsuits wore, yeah. and shoes. The whole thing. You're feeling lazy the day after your wedding. You're feeling tired. Why not be cozy? And that is a philosophy that we keep in our lives and even into our marriage now. That is a wonderful philosophy of life. <laughs> keep it cozy. Keep it cozy. OK, here we go. You ready? This is question number two. You've heard of Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, right? Yes. This is a list of things that are all true of du Sable except for one. Which one of these is not true of du Sable? A, he operated an inn called the Sauganash Hotel. B, 
he was captured by the British in the Revolutionary War. C, he married a Native American woman named Kitty Hawa. Or D, he amassed a collection of paintings and fine furniture. Which one of those is not true of DuSable? That is actually a pretty wild life. You know, he was, he was quite a guy. <laughs> you know, don't whisper. I want to hear the debate. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> they all sound like they could all be true. That's the idea. I, I'm pretty sure that he did marry a Native woman. You are correct. Yeah, Kitty Hawa. You don't think he amassed a collection of paintings and fine furniture? I don't. You know, 1780 in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But actually he did. Uh, I don't think he was captured by the British. Maybe you should think he was captured by the British. <laughs> Maybe I should think he was captured by the British. All right. I'm going to venture maybe running the inn. You are right. He did not <laughs> own the Sauganash Hotel. So there was a Sauganash Hotel in Chicago, but that was operated by a man named Marc Bobian, who used to say, I plays the fiddle like the devil, and I keeps hotel like hell. <laughs> I like that. I'm just going to randomly drop that knowledge at cocktail parties if we ever have them again. I think that's perfect. <laughs> All right, Zay Dorn, you're the head of radio TV film at Northwestern, is that right? I am, that's right. Obviously, you know, I could ask you a lot about academia and all of that, but what I really want to know is you were a bat boy for the Chicago Cubs. I was, just, you know, ceremonially a couple of times, but it was a great part of my childhood. I was a huge fan and got to be a bat boy, I think, when I was about eight years old and then when I was about 10 or 11 as well. I had long, long hair, so it was a little bit strange in the 1980s to be a bat boy with hair down to your waist coming out of your little blue plastic cap. Yeah, I bet. Okay, final question. Okay. So we had a little fire in Chicago in 1871. You probably heard of that. Oh, and with all the Aquanet and nail polish that I use, you don't think I was a little <laughs> panicky? <laughs> All right, to help the city recover from the Great Fire of 1871, England's Queen Victoria sent Chicago what? A, one of the crown jewels worth $1.4 million in today's dollars. B, 50 royal hunting hounds to help recover human remains. Wow. C, 30,000 Shetland wool blankets. Or D, a biography about her husband, Prince Albert. She was a million laughs at Victoria. <laughs> I don't think a crown jewel, that doesn't make much sense. Yeah, they're not going to pry a crown jewel. They're not going to let, let go of those. The last one was a biography of her yeah, husband? A book. I would not want to be part of a, a, a gift exchange with her. A book for the Chicago Fire. It'd be a good answer to the question. I think the book was the only one that stands out, so I think it was a book. You are correct! <gasps> yes! <laughs> what a wild gift, though. <laughs> Amazing. She gave us a book. Bizarre, but she must have had good intentions. Actually, it turned out to be a pretty important gift for Chicago, and here's why. Queen Victoria's idea to help rebuild Chicago was to send us a book about her husband. An early history of the prince consort. But it's not as lame as it sounds. The gift was one of some 8,000 books donated from the people of England to Chicago as, quote, a mark of sympathy now, and a keepsake and a token of true brotherly kindness forever. But this was more than just a transatlantic book club. This donation would give birth to the Chicago Public Library, which did not exist before the fire. Oh sure, we had plenty of saloons, but no libraries. The first home for all those books was inside a water tank that survived the fire. It was at Adams and LaSalle, site of the Rookery building today. Now, 80 Chicago Public Library branches later, we can thank the royal subjects of Her Majesty the Queen. Guess what? You did so well that you get to do a lightning round. Oh, I got to make sure my defibrillator is standing in case I pass out. Lori, you are one of Chicago's best known uh, HIV AIDS and gay rights activists. We're a division of the Heartland Alliance. We represent the HIV AIDS division for food and nutrition. We've made adjustments because of COVID and we're still getting the goods out to those who suffer. Well, it's so amazing what you're doing. Thank you. 
All right, here we go. Uh, the clock will start when I start asking the question. For each of the following neighborhoods, say whether or not it is one of Chicago's 77 designated community areas often considered the official list of Chicago neighborhoods. Just say yes or no. Here we go. Albany Park. No. Yes. Uh, Bridgeport. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Wrigleyville. No. You are correct, that's part of Lakeview. Bronzeville. No. Correct, that's part of Grand Boulevard in Douglas. Rogers Park, where you live. No. Uh, yes, actually, that is a Chicago community area. Pilsen. Yes. Uh, no, surprisingly, it's part of Lower West Side. Who knew we had a Lower West Side in Chicago? Uh, Uptown. Yes. Uh, O'Hare. No. Weirdly, it's yes. Uh, Wicker Park. Yes. Actually, no, that's part of West Town. Lincoln Square. No. Yes. Uh, Mount Greenwood. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Bucktown. Yes. Actually, that's no, it's part of Logan Square. Pullman. Yes. Yes, and time is up. You got six right. Lightning round did me in, Jeffrey. You are just a delight to talk to. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeffrey. Over and out. Okay, on to our next victims. I mean, contestants. And now, the second round. Ezra, it's a school day when we're recording this, and you're actually at school right now? I am at school. I am currently at Ida Crown Jewish Academy. I'm a senior. Are you cutting class right now? I'm actually in a free period, so. <laughs> Ezra was actually an extra on our recent L tour. Uh, I think we have a yeah, clip. Well, Don't blink, line, you're gonna miss it, but see if you can spot Ezra in here. No question, that was my favorite L ride of all time. <laughs> all right, here we go, you ready? Yeah. This is your first question. What famous rap artist is a graduate of Jones College Prep, which is an elite Chicago public high school? Is it A, Lupe Fiasco, B, Common, C, Kanye West, or D, Chance the Rapper? So I think the, they're all from Chicago. Yes. If I am not mistaken, thinking of the west side of Lupe. I like the thought process here. You're working through it. But I feel like it's Lupe. Uh, oh. <laughs> Ezra, any idea? For some reason, I think it's Chance the Rapper. I think Chance the Rapper is, went to Jones. I know this one because I also went to Jones, so it's Chance the Rapper. <laughs> awesome! <laughs> and by the way, Lupe is going to be one of our contestants coming oh up. <laughs> so he's going to see that question. So you're a veteran of being on WTTW. I am a little bit. I've been <laughs> featured a couple of times in a few stories. The anchor of our Chicago Tonight program, Brandis Friedman, introduced you as Mrs. Englewood. Harris, I know you've got uh, Mrs. Englewood with you this time. I'm married to my neighborhood. <laughs> you were not always married to your neighborhood. In fact, you were going to move and they were giving you a going away party, right? Me and my husband were going to move to um, Atlanta, Georgia. I have a vacant lot across the street from my house and I saw these kids playing in that lot. And I just looked at them and I said, they have to have something else to do and I have to be able to create something else for them to do. And that took me on a journey of finding out what I can do in my community. Oh my gosh, that is very inspiring. Thank you. All right, second question. This is a tricky one. Three first ladies of the United States were born in Chicago or the suburbs. Of course, Hillary Clinton was born in Park Ridge. Michelle Obama was born in Greater Grand Crossing. Who's the third who was born in Chicago or the suburbs? A, Nancy Reagan. B, Mary Todd Lincoln. C, Betty Ford. Or D, Julia Grant, Mrs. Ulysses S. Grant. Shaking your head like you got no idea. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, I know General Grant had an Illinois relationship. Galena, correct? Grant? Uh, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> Reagan, I know, um, lived out lived west of Chicago. I'm gonna go with Nancy Reagan. Uh, no, it's not Nancy Reagan. Yeah, with Betty Ford. Really? Yeah. You're gonna stick with that? Yeah, I think I'm gonna go with Betty Ford. You got it right, it is Betty Ford. Really, I would never know that. She's a Chicagoan. Well, kind of. She lived here for a few weeks after she was born and then her family moved to Colorado and then Michigan, so. But she was born in Chicago. Okay, I gotta get some right now, come on. Well, I don't know these either till I look them up, so. All right, here we go. 
Will Quam. Hi, Jeffrey. So you are an expert on Chicago brick? I am indeed, I am. I'm obsessed with it. I, I go everywhere I can to see it. Uh, it's my passion. So does that make you the most interesting person at the party or the least interesting person at the party? I guess it, go, it goes either way. There's no in between. It's one or the other. <laughs> Chicago is a city full of brick because of our history with fire. And for that front brick, we brought in tons of brick from around the country. But most of the brick in our buildings was made right here in Chicago from the swampy clay underneath us. All right. Well, let's go on with your third question. Okay. We had a big World's Fair in Chicago in 1893 in Jackson Park. Of course, those buildings were made of plaster, not brick, and they didn't last. They burned down. Here we go. Chicago's second World's Fair opened on the lakefront on May 27, 1933. The switch that set the fair in motion was ceremonially turned on by A, newly elected President Franklin Roosevelt in the Oval Office, B, concentrated light from a distant star, C, scandalous fan dancer Sally Rand, or D, five-year-old movie star Shirley Temple. Was this the fair that was like the century of progress? That is right, very good. Progress, future. I would have loved to see Shirley Temple do it. Is it Shirley Temple? Wouldn't that have been great? She could like <laughs> tap dance up to there and like turn it on and all that. No, she was only five. Uh, I'm gonna go with C, the feather dancer. <laughs> the fan dancer? No, because see, if she had moved her hand away to turn on the lights, she would have exposed herself. So definitely can't be Sally. <laughs> I speak as a space camp graduate. Uh, <laughs> concentrated light from a telescope. And you are absolutely right. <laughs> and here's the story. Many stars attended Chicago's 1933 World's Fair, but only one of them had the honor of kicking off the festivities. Arcturus, the fourth brightest star in the night sky, set off the chain reaction that lit up the century of progress. How? The giant telescope at Yerkes Observatory near Lake Geneva focused Arcturus's starlight onto a photoelectric cell that sent an impulse to Chicago over Western Union telegraph lines. A cloudy forecast worried astronomers about leaving the fair in the dark, but when the critical moment arrived, Arcturus shined bright and flipped the switch that brilliantly illuminated the fair. Why was Arcturus chosen? While astronomers back then thought the star was 40 light years away from Earth, so the beams that lit up the century of progress would have left the star at the same time Chicago hosted its first World's Fair in 1893. Today we know the distance is actually 37 light years, but let's keep that to ourselves. So are you an aspiring actress? For about four years, I was part of the Albany Park Theater Project. I would sneak out with my brothers and spend hours in the field. I definitely am a little bit introverted, but um, once I'm on that stage, it's like a whole different world, and I sort of open up, and it's, it's a fantastic feeling. You wouldn't want to sing a few bars for us here, would you? Um, I wouldn't know what. I wouldn't know what to sing. <laughs> oh, all right. I don't want to embarrass you. This is a lightning round of just general knowledge questions. Here we go. An actual column from ancient Rome on a pedestal behind Soldier Field was donated to Chicago by what dictator? Uh, Mussolini. Correct. Uh, what was the name of the illegal numbers game popular in African-American communities before the Illinois State Lottery put it out of business? Pass. That was policy. Where was mobster John Dillinger gunned down by the FBI? Um, outside the biograph theater. Excellent! What famous Southside meat market was named for two animal sounds? Um... Oh, come on, time's running out. All right, we'll skip that one. Moo and oink. Um, what invasive fish are swimming up the Mississippi River threatening the Great Lakes? The Asian carp. Correct. What topping never, ever goes on a Chicago hot dog? Ketchup. Of course. What is the alley behind the Archbishop's Mansion paved with? Uh, bricks. No, wooden blocks. What famous <laughs> assassin played the sinister role of Shakespeare's Richard III in Chicago? Pass. Time's up. Oh, uh, that was John Wilkes Booth. He was an oh. actor. <laughs> you did well. You got four of them. That was exciting. Oh. All right. Well, you sure you don't want to sing a few bars for us? Okay. Where the blue of the night meets the gold of the day, someone waits for me. 
<laughs> Welcome back to the Great Chicago Quiz Show, where we've saved the best for last. Well, we'll see about that. It's the third round. Please welcome Grammy Award-winning rapper Lupe Fiasco. There you go. There you go. I got you. Okay, wait a second. You have a map of the L? Yep. <laughs> Never get lost. Lawrence Holmes, Midday Host, 670 The Score, Sports Radio. Oh, I love this. This is so great. Chris, that looks like my doctor's office right there. Where are you? <laughs> I work at a clinic, so here I am. Lupe, I have to tell you, I watched a little bit of that film that you made in China. Yeah, I have a company called uh, uh, Studio SV, and we did a series called Beaten Path, which is about me going to China, the birthplace of Kung Fu, and learning Kung Fu at the source. Did you get hurt? Yeah, I got hurt. I think I got hurt. For insurance purposes, maybe not. But from ego-wise and bruise-wise, yes. All right, here we go. I'm going to ask you three multiple-choice questions. You ready? Right. Okay, this is a sports question. Wait, oh, is the <laughs> quiz officially beginning? This is it. The quiz is officially beginning. Let me get my laptop and my Google out. Not allowed, not allowed. <laughs> All right, here's your question. While Soldier Field was being remodeled in 2002, having a spaceship put on top of it, the Chicago Bears played their home games somewhere else. Where? A, Northwestern University's Ryan Field in Evanston, B, the University of Illinois Memorial Stadium in Champaign. C, Olivet Nazarene University in Bourbonnais, the Bears' summer camp. Or D, Wrigley Field, which was the home of the Bears from 1921 to 1970. Ah, I know the answer to this, but I, I want to try and walk it through a little bit. I'm going to say C. Olivet Nazarene? Yeah. That is where they have their training camp. Um, it, but it's hard to have uh, much of a crowd. Uh, I think it seats about 25 people. Uh, I was talking about my, my folks down in uh, Kankakee County. That's when my mind went. Because I was like, dang, that's what a practice field is. They would never play all of that because the space isn't big enough. I'm inclined to say that it couldn't be Wrigley, but then that makes me think that it probably has to be Wrigley. No, I think go I mean, with your first instinct there. They do have a great history with Wrigley Field but the dimensions are still a little wonky. I'm gonna go with Northwestern. And that would be a good guess, but it's wrong. Uh, you, my friend, <laughs> are a hurtful man. <laughs> oh. ah. So the answer is Memorial Stadium down in Champaign. That is correct. Yes, oh! <laughs> ah, they went all the way down to Champaign to play? Wow. Crazy. All right, Chris. You are one of our frontline healthcare workers. What is it that you are on the front line of? Would it be the uh, COVID uh, pandemic? I'm just in uh, patient services and a family clinic. I did work on a COVID mobile testing site. It was a crazy ride. A lot of people scared and dealing with a lot. Mm -hmm. You really made a contribution. Thank you, thank you. All right, next question. Um, labor organizer Rudy Lozano lost his bid to become Chicago's first Mexican-American alderman by only 17 votes in 1983. But Rudy Lozano's campaign manager went on to a very high-profile career. Who was he? Was it A, Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia, B, former alderman Danny Solis, C, United Airlines President Oscar Munoz, or D, Chicago School Board President Miguel Del Valle? Why are these questions so difficult <laughs> and technical? I am not that smart. <laughs> Since we are talking about the political world that it would either be Solis or Chewy. I don't believe it's the United Airlines guy. Good, you got it narrowed down, very good. I'm gonna go with A, Chewy Garcia. Chewy is one of my favorite politicians out there, so. I'm gonna go with Chewy. I was going with Chewy Garcia. Hey, Chewy Garcia. And you are right, Chewy Garcia. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> all right, Lawrence Holmes, all kinds of things you could tell me about the Sox, about the Cubs, but I got something else to ask you about to start with, comic okay. books. Yes. <laughs> I can see the interest on your face there. Here, look, I have the encyclopedia of DC Comics right here. <sighs> Marvel year by year, right here on my bookcase. I didn't even know that you were going to ask these things. There's a lot of good storytelling that goes on in comic book writing. Yeah. And now we're seeing a diversification 
of who's telling those stories. That's great. All right, well, we're gonna go into our last question. Chicago's annual Bud Billiken Day features the largest African-American parade in the nation, according to its organizers. Ooh, fun fact. Yeah. This face, when it was much younger, marched in the Bud Billiken Parade. You wanna incorporate that into a future question. Uh, well, I'll incorporate it in this question. Chicago's annual Bud Billiken Day Parade, which featured Lupe Fiasco as a young man. The question is, who was Bud Billiken? A, Chicago's first African-American alderman. B, a Southside car dealer who first sponsored the parade in 1929. C, a fictional character who appeared regularly in the Chicago Defender newspaper, fictional. Or D, an all-star shortstop who played for the Chicago American Giants in the Negro Leagues. Who was Bud Billiken? Uh, it would be outstanding if D were true. That's not the answer, though. Now, you seem to be shaking your head like you already know this. I didn't even need the multiple choice on there. He is a fictional character created by the Defender to sell newspapers or something to do with their sales force. And you are correct. <laughs> the answer is C. How did you know that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he was a fictional character. <laughs> Celebrate. <laughs> and here's the story. With a huge parade and picnic in his honor, Bud Billiken is a household name in Chicago, but there's one problem, he never existed. Bud Billiken was the fictional mascot of a kid's social club started by the legendary Chicago Defender newspaper. But where publisher Robert S. Abbott actually got the name from is a little bit of a mystery. We know this, a Billiken is a chubby elf with pointy ears and a mischievous smile, thought to be the protector of children. Although some say the Billiken originated in China, it was really dreamed up in 1908 and patented by a Missouri art teacher. The Billiken may not have come from China, but a Southside Chinese restaurant had one on display. And legend has it, Robert Abbott saw it and decided it was the perfect character for the paper's regular kids column with the addition of the nickname Bud. The Bud Billiken Club became so popular among Chicago's black youth Abbott decided to stage a parade in 1929. Almost a century later, the annual Bud Billiken Day Parade claims to be the largest African-American parade in the nation. So while Bud Billiken himself might be fictional, his spirit marches on. All right, before we go, it's time for the contestants' revenge where contestants get to turn the tables on me and ask me a question. And in order to do that, we've brought back Sandra Grigoletti. Sandra, I'm a little nervous about this. You know your Chicago probably is better than I do. And do I understand you got married on the L? I sure did. We uh, rented a train and we took a whole little Chicago tour with a Chicago-themed wedding to back it. You guys are made for each other. Yeah, we're, we're Chicagoans through and through. All right, go ahead. What is your question? Part of the Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill Master Plan, this two-tower structure grew at an astonishing rate, finishing just over a year after they started in November of 2019. Oh, man. All right, so I can tell from the picture that this is that Lakeshore East, just on the south bank of the river. Uh, so you know what, I have to tell you, I do not know the name of the structures. What are those towers called? It's called Cascade and Cirrus. Cascade, now, yes. well, I, really, that's tough. Cascade and Cirrus, but that was a good question. I'm very proud of helping build those towers. So. Right, because you are involved in construction engineering, right? I teach people how to use construction robots. Did robots build this tower? No, we've been using some level of robotics on construction sites for a while. Okay, well, Sandra Grigoletti and all of our contestants, thank you so much for joining us. Please tune in again next time for the Great Chicago Quiz Show.